my pleasure uh, to moderate this second and final panel called The Technological Turn, Human Judgment uh, and Artificial Intelligence. Now, it's a, it's a subject uh, in which I have a great deal of personal interest uh, in what I call the decision maker's dilemma, uh, the kind of AI challenge to human judgment, which is the uh, title of my uh, forthcoming book next year. So my agent insisted I say that. Okay, now the question of whether risk has entered the age of artificial intelligence has long been, I would say, resolved. Uh, it's there to stay, it's driven down costs, it works for the most part, it seems. And every day, millions of decisions are made by financial institutions to accept credit risk uh, and, or to refuse loans. But I think that there is a shadow side. Uh, human judgment and experience are becoming less and less uh, part of the equation. And uh, the significant shift to the, to the algorithm has resulted in, yes, tremendous efficiency gains, but um, uh, and created a kind of a well-founded uh, risk acceptance regime. But uh, that machine-assisted uh, decision-making has become an all-out transformation, okay? So where once machines would work with human judgment, let's say, to accelerate it and to increase, uh, you know, latency times. We now live and work uh, within a near universal acceptance that artificial intelligence is, quote, better, unquote. The original bargain was that um, was that machines would replace low risk decision making and highly re repetitious tasks. Right, and generally increase productivity and efficiency. Okay, check. The increasing orthodoxy about machines, though, represents an entirely new and challenging set of circumstances with widespread implications for human judgment within organization. And history teaches us that models people rely on are often not very good, and we heard that in the, uh, with, uh, with the previous conversation. So what will this new decision-making environment demand of us? And how does a system where most of the decisions are already taken or pre-programmed redefine the space for human judgment? So we'll discuss those very questions in this fast-paced dialogue, which I'm joined by the following panelists. And I'll introduce, I'll introduce uh, our distinguished panelists now, uh, starting with, uh, with Dr. Bruce Choi. Uh, Dr. Choi leads the research division of the Global Risk Institute, a think tank focused on, on the future and emerging tasks faced by the Canadian economy. He is an experienced global business leader, being a formal general manager with a top 10 bank, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, uh, and a former partner and risk consulting practice leader with one of the big four professional services firms. Dr. Choi was an awarded a doctorate from the University of Sydney, Australia, uh, for his research on the mathematics uh, for risk management. He, uh, he is a university and RA Priddle medalist from the University of Sydney's Faculty of Engineering and a Sloan Fellow from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. There's a lot of Stanford here today, Bruce. Uh, he is a governor of, the, of George, George Brown College and the chair of their audit committee and an advisory board member for Rotman's Fin Hub at the University of Toronto. A very warm welcome to you, uh, Dr. Choi. Uh, uh, now, the second, our second esteemed guest uh, is Mr. Tim Hogarth, who is a senior technology professional who has worked in banks and in multiple countries. He is currently with uh, ANZ, which is the Australia and New Zealand Banking Group in Melbourne as their chief architect, uh, engineering and technology, accountable for technology strategy, architecture and engineering practices. Now, prior to this role, Tim worked for the... Uh, TD Bank in Toronto, holding the role of Chief Innovation Officer, where he built out the bank's lab, uh, lab ecosystem and steered the investment fund that took small stakes in a range of startups. Very interesting. Before then, Tim established himself as a tenure, with a 10-year track record at the Commonwealth Bank in Sydney. Uh, and he's joining us from Sydney, so it's the middle of the night. So uh, that's a very special uh, uh, effort to uh, to be here today, and uh, I have a very warm welcome uh, to you, Tim. You're very passionate about using technology to advance organization, improve people's lives, and we're going to be discussing exactly that. Our final panelist today is uh, is James Bradshaw. 
Uh, James is the banking reporter for the Report on Business at the Globe and Mail. Uh, since early 2017, he's covered the country's largest banks as well as other prominent financial services firms and fintechs. Uh, he's been reporting with the Globe for more than a decade. Uh, and he's also covered media from 2014 to 2016 and higher education from 2010 to 2014. So very interesting kind of angles of vision that you're bringing to uh, to the uh, to the report on business and to banking. You've also covered uh, uh, cultural uh, and po policy and news for Globe Arts. You've written for the editorial page of the, and the Toronto section, and you won the Edward Goff Penny Memorial Prize recognizing work by young journalists. And so a very warm welcome to you, uh, to you all. Uh, different CVs, different angles of vision. This is what we're looking for. So uh, I'd like to call now on uh, on Dr. Choi to uh, we'll give uh, each of the panelists five minutes as we did in the in the first in the first panel. Uh, so uh, the opening statements five minutes apiece, and uh, we'll start with uh, with Dr. Choi. Thank you. Go ahead, Bruce. All right. So, so firstly, Lawrence, I want to thank you for inviting me here today. And I'm you know, truly honoured here to be in company of um, Tim and James and Tim, mate. So good to see you back in the uh, Canadian, uh, talking to the Canadian audience again. And James, all the work that you do in, in um, uh, reporting over the years on the banks is just a real asset to the industry. So I'll start off with um, uh, three things to kick off some contemporary observations. So number one, the scope of application is increasing. That increases the risk. Number two, without guardrails, biases are going to be amplified. And the third one is um, fairness. That's a cultural aspect. It's an important societal discussion that just has to be had. So starting off, you know, technology is just becoming ubiquitous, as Lawrence is saying. You know, applications are just taking away more human agency from the decision-making process. And the scope of the application is such a big factor in assessing the risk. Now, for example, the resource allocation algorithms that you use by police and ambulances to determine where their resources go is a matter of life and death. And it's so different to the app that recognises that I enjoy retro music just because the last thing I listened was Aha's Take On Me. Number two, the, um, the second observation is that um, AI without a moral compass, the AI algorithms are digesting this information naturally will amplify biases, and often in very dangerous ways. Now, the, the Bayesian inference, inf, uh, inference engines that we see are so helpful to determine which movie I might want to watch next on my Netflix account has also been shown as a great way to put like-minded ideologues into echo chambers and amplify that extremist rhetoric in action. Now, we certainly have seen that in play in the elections and referendums of the past decade, and it's very much fueling the anti-science, anti-vax movement that we're seeing today. And Neil had mentioned this earlier in um, his keynote discussion. But then that leads to the third point, which I want to cover, which is, you know, bias. What is it and what is fair? Now, cultural differences in particular mean that the fair application of AI will be different around the world. Now, this can be seen how in the last couple of years, Western nations have been railing against, and there's a massive backlash on facial recognition AI technology. Um, you know, and that AI technology happens to be the cornerstone of, of China's social credit system. Now, will this in the future lead to regulatory arbitrage, where some parts of the world, the new technology will get deployed and there'll be a bifurcation of who will actually be reaping the rewards of such advances? So for risk managers, I feel there's just a lot of things that we have to think about today. Bruce, thank you. Thank you very much. Those are very powerful points. And uh, I will uh, now turn it over to, to Tim, Tim Hogarth, uh, and uh, for, your, for your five minutes. And thank you very much, Bruce. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, thank you for the opportunity of speaking with everyone. And um, yeah, it's the middle of the night, but it's, I, I do miss Toronto and it'd be good to be back there. Um, I'm currently in Sydney and I'm stuck in lockdown and it's been approximately 125 days since my last haircut, so I'm not normally this scruffy. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what I saw as, I guess, the, some of the challenges or concerns that people see with AI. And I, I don't actually like using the term AI so much. Um, I prefer to talk about this as machine learning. 
Um, this is probably the most significant shift in computing technology made by Geoffrey Hinton in the University of Toronto back in 2012, since probably the introduction of the internet in 1995, it's got that many ramifications. But there's this degree of unease with this technique, which is just essentially shifting from a model where we hard code the rules by interpreting the world and saying, we think this is the rules, so we'll turn the rules from human language into computer language, to using statistical techniques to say, based on this data, these correlations can be inferred. And as I see one area of, of anxiety is, is um, because people don't understand it conceptually. Um, people who are not in our industry, people who are some distance away, think of artificial intelligence as essentially magic. And they don't really understand it and they're a little fearful of its power. But the bigger problem that faces our industry is not understanding it deterministically. Because artificial intelligence, essentially, when you use a machine learning technique over a large set of data, it'll find every odd permutation of correlation that will actually generate a result. And it will then say, this is the weights of the loan, or this is the reason why the doctor should look at the scan more closely, or this is the reason why um, this the car should stop suddenly. And these techniques are not expressed in rules, they're expressed in weights and probabilities. And this has been enormously powerful. The actual power that comes out of this is tremendous. We've seen um, examples where AIs uh, that detect um, breast cancers on medical imaging dramatically better than the average um, the average uh, pra um, medical practitioner. We've seen the ability for similar on skin cancer scans to be so much more accurate and save people's lives. The problem, though, is just people are really worried about you cannot see how it came up with those decisions. That that audit trail is not always there, and the word bias creeps in all of the time. Now, the catch is in financial services is just that there is a degree of bias, it's the wrong word, but we want to make sure that we actually favour certain types of loans. We favour, we wish to fear things. We want to make sure that certain transactions are not fraudulent. So we look out the markers that are indications of fraud. We have to then ensure that those markers are actually ethical. I think you said it very well, Bruce, is that making sure that you've got an ethos behind this is really, really hard because the AI is just a dumb computer. It's not intelligent at all. It just looks at the data and looks at patterns. And so I think what we've really got to do as an industry is spend a lot of energy making sure everyone understands conceptually what AI does, but then also spending a lot of energy proving out how come the models made a given decision and why we are comfortable with that decision. And it's not sufficient to just use privacy around this because you can take away all of the markers of someone's uh, privacy and their name, so their, their date of birth, all of those details, but just from their spending behaviour, from their um, interactions, it's very easy to infer a lot of information about them and, and unwittingly make decisions based on ethnicity or, or age or something. So I think it's an important um, thing. It's not going away. This technology and technique is effectively in an arms race around the world. It's something we need to stare into, and I think we need to effectively decide on the rules of how we're going to use it. How we're going to how we're going to manage problems. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Those are uh, those are a really interesting set of uh, set of observations. I would just uh, I would just make a uh, a comment to to our audience to uh, as you're as you're listening uh, to us, you may have some questions. Uh, we encourage questions to come in. So uh, uh, write write them down and send them in, uh, and uh, I'll I'll get to them uh, in the in the latter portion. Uh, um, I have the pleasure of uh, of sending it over to to James Bradshaw, uh, and he's taking a little break from writing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the B one of you know the pages of the uh, report on business to uh, to be with us today. And so, a warm welcome to you, and over to you. Thanks, Lawrence. Right now, I'm mostly taking a break from chasing my two year old daughter who's homesick around the house, but uh, so this is very nice and peaceful. Um, I like Bruce. I'm also uh, quite sort of humbled to be here. I'm much more used to sitting in Lawrence's moderator chair asking the questions. And uh, if you heard my boss, David Walmsley, bring up uh, chief ignorance officers earlier today, I've already told him I'll be applying for that position imminently. <laughs> but I hope that uh, we've got a lot of a lot of banking expertise on this panel uh, and they're going to give you that depth. But I hope I can give you a bit of a perspective of someone who follows the banks very closely each day but also looks at them as, as something as, of an outsider. Um, 
It's instructive to me that we're here talking about AI at a conference about risk, because it's abundantly clear to me that as much as bankers are excited about the opportunities and potentials of this technology, and they really are, I think that exuberance is still significantly restrained for now by concerns about risks, because culturally banks obviously are their risk managers, they're cautious. And I think that even extends to the fintech sector as much as, as the, some of those companies may want to embrace the, the Wild West uh, sort of ethos of Silicon Valley. They don't want to lose money uh, or have a cyber event or a privacy breach any more than a traditional bank does. Um, so all of which is to say, I think financial institutions want to be leaders in this area, but they're not going to move fast and break things. They're not going to surf on the bleeding edge of, of machine learning, at least not with real money. Maybe they will in test environments. So I would expect that we're going to see quite a prolonged period where human intervention actually is prominent and, and remains a constant in banking. And the pandemic's a helpful example of that. I've talked with a lot of risk officers and bankers about how their models performed in the pandemic. And you know, and, and the the instances where historical data could only take you so far and, and humans had to layer a good deal of their own judgment honed over decades uh, on top of the, you know, the decisions they were making because the models simply didn't understand the way, for example, unprecedented government stimulus and, and public health lockdown measures would skew the outcomes for, for credit and for solvency. And so that sort of conventional relationship between, for example, unemployment and credit losses was a bit broken. Um, but I think the pandemic is also a great example of where a model that's more adaptable and pre predictive because it is able to use machine learning might have an enormous benefit. You know, it might uh, adapt to the situation we're in much more quickly. And that could be an enormous thing. Um, I also think it's, uh, you know, important to draw a distinction. And, and Tim said he doesn't even like using the term artificial intelligence. Just between simple automation that is replacing a lot of the routine and rote tasks that, that banks have um, and machine learning where machines are really making decisions on their own. And, and just to sort of touch on a point that he made and, and that Caroline Northcott set up for us, you know, one of the interesting thinkers on this topic that I've interviewed a couple of times is, is Fotini Agrafiotti at, at RBC's Borealis Lab. And, and she was quite candid that, you know, you direct the algorithm about how to learn, but you don't, all, you don't tell it what to do. Um, and in some cases, those decisions are still a bit of a black box because you can see the input, you can see the output, you know mathematically what's happening in between, but we're still working on how you figure out how that decision was made. And that just brings up a huge issue of trust and trust is at the foundations of the banking system. And if we're gonna look ahead to the world that Lawrence has described for us, you know, people at banks need to be able to trust uh, that the AI is, is, is doing what it's supposed to. Their customers wanna trust that they're being treated fairly about it and, and that they can get an explanation about why uh, when it seems like they're not. And Caroline, I think, and, and others have also talked about regulators and regulators will really want to have a clear picture that banks have a handle on this uh, before we wade too far into it. So I think it's only with a lot of trust, a big increase in trust in these systems that we're going to see uh, the machines be allowed to be the decision makers on a, a meaningful scale, because rightly or wrongly, I think some of us still have greater trust in, in people as flaws as, as they are. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now and we can uh, get into some discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, yeah, there'll be a lot of competition for the chief ignorance officer and also the... Um, um, the chief uncertainty officer. So it went uh, went uh, a, a couple of uh, a couple of ways. Where do we uh, apply, James? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so I guess my my yeah there there's a, there's a lot to there's a lot to unpack uh, pack there in terms of uh, in terms of the process uh, from which uh, we actually make uh, decisions and what the machines have to do with it. Uh, and uh, the relationship between uh, between AI and use it as a um, as a, as shorthand, Tim, uh, uh, and and human judgment, not not necessarily what I, uh, AI can do, but uh, who decides. And our I suppose our our collective experience. You know, James talks about the uh, about the trust issue. Our collective experience with social media, for example, can teach us. I would say three things about a uh, possible future experience with AI, okay? First, innovation comes with the power to really relentlessly, I would say, reformat 
our civil society and our relationships, uh, despite best of intentions. And I think Carol was mentioned that in mentioning that in Cosimo and uh, many others. I think everybody was mentioning that. It's uh, it is uh, ubiquitous. The second point is that uh, technologies and their promoters will often promise one thing, but deliver uh, deliver another. And sometimes maybe unconsciously or what have you, but they're not looking at the uh, at the uh, accountability measures or or what is actually going into uh, into that uh, into that black box. And I would say the third is that the more we embrace these technologies, the more we need perhaps to assert our our values and our sovereignty. And I think that is uh, one of the threads that is uh, running through uh, each of each of the panelists' uh, uh, opening remarks. So I'm going to go to all of you. I'll go. I'll go round robin. Uh, you know, uh, again, and then we'll get into maybe some uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit more specificity. But uh, Bruce, why don't you why don't you take that on? So the big question is how will this how will this these developments generally affect the way we approach risks and what uh, what dangers and opportunities does it does it pose? So I'll tag on your um, your Facebook comment, as in that that was a, a social media comment, as in uh, I often joke with the uh, with the researchers here at um, the Global Risk Institute. It wouldn't it have been so good back in you know, when we first started in two thousand and nine to have done a case study on on um, Facebook and so and the rise of social media? It wouldn't have been that difficult to have predicted. Hey, what it does is an algorithm that puts like people like, and where could that go wrong? Um, so it, that and that's come from scope creep. You know, the original Facebook was some guy's way of you know rating people in a cheap dating app, um, and then it, it expanded out to the way way it has. And that's one area that's um, for risk management on, on AI. You have to be very aware of now, what was the original application built for, and then someone says, "Hey, I can I can extend that and extend that," and whether that applicability applicability come, comes in. Um, and so doing doing that backcasting of of hey this technology and where could it go bad, uh, a very good practice for, for us risk managers. And you know I'll I'll appeal to you, Lawrence. Is in got to look at history. Uh, you got to look at some of the ex examine some of the historical failures that we've had. You know, Twenty fourteen when Amazon started to, using AI to to manage their mountains of applications. Um, only to find out after two years that it was biasing against women. Um, could you imagine if you implemented that as a credit engine, auto decision in credit engine at BMO? Hey, yes. 2016, chat, chat box by Microsoft uh, when they, they launched um, Tay out into the Twitterverse. It took less than 16 hours before that chat box was spouting racist remarks um, and, and just, just being abusive. Because it was learning that was what you do in Twitter. Um, you know, once again, an unsupervised chat. But if you if you put that as as part of a, a BMO's call center, you'd never want something like that. <laughs> Facial yes, recognition no. technology, another one where you know there, there's been so many studies out there where um, for law enforcement where uh, the identification of a person of color. Uh, is 10 to 100 times worse, depending on which, which sample size they're looking at, um, than a white male. Uh, so, you know, that, you know you, you, it's bad enough with the, with the Black Lives Matter situation, that how, how, how they're being treated by humans. Could you imagine if a Robocop comes, comes along that way? Switching out to BMO, could you be locked out of your account because of facial recognition technology? Didn't know this because you're Asian? Or black, as in, there, there are risks that come in when it starts scope creeping, and this yes. is the stuff that we we have to be aware of. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, no. I think you're uh, you're right on. I would just I would just say that when people when people are talking about say looking at the ha uh, the past or using pa the past as models, what the, what they're not talking about about the kind of history that that you know I write or uh, the directors of the Long Run Institute as historians write or Neil Ferguson write, is writing. They're looking at time series data and they're looking at, at the raw data. They're not looking at the, at the analysis and the qualitative judgment that the long run uh, experiences uh, actually shows you that these models are really not very good or are, you know, are flawed in one way or another. 
but uh, I think that you very nicely picked up on the uh, on the on the cultural on the on the cultural shadow side uh, the dimension uh, of uh, of that. Uh, so let's uh, uh, okay. So let's go let's go to Tim. What what are what are your views on uh, on uh, on on the question uh, or even what Bruce said? I'm I'm more of the optimist. Um, I think that uh, I think there are there's I mean people often talk about where AIs have gone wrong, but there are many 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 more examples of where humans have gone wrong. Humans make bad decisions all the time. People make people are racist all the time on the internet as well. Um, I think the faith in this is. Like all with all technology, you've got to understand what you're actually deploying, and then choose to choose your weapon carefully. But it shouldn't start with this fear that it's going to instinctively, and it's not that it's systemically wrong. It's just using a specific technique, and the responsibility on the person using it is to understand both the technique you're using, the data, but then also making sure it's ethically bound. So using um, traditional rules to try and detect a fraud. On, on, Customer is pretty coarse and pretty simple. Using AI and taking examples of like this is how people are actually um, stealing customers' passwords. This is how they're actually. This is what we do with banks all the time. Start to work out the patterns of what uh, what um, the bad guys are doing in probing in customers' accounts, and then saying, look, these are behaviours. This particular pattern of transactions is fundamentally atypical with this customer and very typical of fraud. It's, it's like they're transferring the money to a mule account. So you couldn't do that with the traditional rules where a programmer has to go in, oh, they've now tried this new technique, we'll write some new code. By using the software to actually detect the patterns, you're able to move much more nimbly and protect customers' money and their reputations. If we think about being able to just, um, find um, indications of serious organised crime, um, what I also look at in, in, in some of the systems we look at is, is you can actually use these techniques to analyse this huge amount of data around how systems are performing and try and use it to detect problems before they occur. Um, so I think there's an enormous power there. What, the, the example I like that I've seen used in one of the banks I've worked for was you ensure that an AI researcher is always has uh, an ambassador sitting next to them. And if you wouldn't do this without AI, then you shouldn't do it with AI. Um, this to me, though, is just a computing technique that's a, a thousand times more powerful than normal computing techniques. So if you're worried about a problem occurring, the existing systems can probably just as equally make the problem and make, make the problem occur mm. as well. It's just that the AI's power is a little frightening because it can learn so quickly. Now, now Tim, I would guess that ANZ uh, makes many consumer decisions by machine. And how do they? How do they? How do you compensate for the some of the risks that are that seem inherent in machine machine learning and AI, like bias and not understanding how it works and so forth? I think um, so. We use AI across in ANZ. I couldn't even count the number of places it's actually used. We, we, all the products we purchase all often have machine learning techniques. From being trying to understand what a customer is saying on the phone, so you can route them to the right call center operative through to anticipating what a customer's doing on a website and whether or not it's out of form, whether or not they're, the way they're holding a device is an indication that's being, that it's being used by another um, by a criminal instead of themselves. Um, when you actually, the, the credit risk models in Australia, just like they would be in Canada, um, I think the regulators are appropriately um, focused on ensuring that the models that have been proven over the last 50 years continue to be used and as they evolve, they're done in close concert. Um, the risk decisions are, at the moment, as I understand, aren't being changed yet to using machine learning models for that kind of decision making. But machine learning models are used often as research, right, to find things. And you can find so much more potential clues and cues um, for uh, what customers might want to actually spend. Um, I can't reference one from my bank, but I do know of a Canadian retailer that discovered that the most profitable customer um, for their credit card was one who purchased a snow roof shovel. I think that's what it's called. The thing that scraps snow off the roof. Yes. <laughs> um, turns out they were the very, very best customers to be actually sell on a credit card. Hmm. A traditional credit scoring model would never have discovered that. Yeah. Never ever have discovered it. And there's no harm at all foul in that particular one because that's then implemented as a policy. So researching this information is often, often a really powerful technique doesn't necessarily mean you then hand the keys to the car 
to the, the blind of course. of course. Fascinating. And um, I'm going to go out and buy my roof snow shovel, I think, <laughs> and maybe get my uh, credit score increased. And I would, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. And, uh, and over to you, James. You've got a, you've got a, a like I said, uh, kind of a different angle of vision as you, you know, you're seeing kind of system wide from the, uh, as an outsider. So as others see us, right? Uh, and so um, what, where, where do you think the, uh, the dangers and opportunities, uh, opportunities are? You've, you started to talk about some of them, of course, but uh, are there ones that, that uh, are, let's say, a little bit more sharp to you or uh, uh, are they all equally uh, uh, kind of 800 pound gorillas? Well, I'll, I'll pick up on a couple of things my fellow panelists have said. I'll, I'll start with the opportunities, the good news, and, and then get to maybe some of the less good news. I think Tim is dead right to talk about, for example, the way machines are just vastly superior at detecting patterns that can tell you about fraud or cybersecurity risk or things like that. And I think we have to acknowledge that those battles are largely being fought now at machine speed on very large scales against bots and other computing networks. And if we don't embrace AI, if a, you know, a, <laughs> there's a real problem. There's no alternative at this point. And so I think it's vital in that sense. Uh, I think to the point about uh, you know, figuring out that, uh, that, that uh, the customer who buys the snow scraper is, is the ideal person for a store credit card, I also think we're seeing a lot of experimentation in how to use what's I think often called alternative data as new ways to adjudicate and underwrite credit and to assess potential customers. And, and that's got some good aspects to it. I think we should get beyond credit scores. And I think we're finding new ways to be, you know, inclusive about who gets credit and, and, and who gets financial services without, you know, without uh, increasing risks or taking new risks. And in some cases, probably even decreasing the risks. I think the other side of this, uh, to, to maybe to Bruce's point a little bit about the Facebook example, is that I think we have a certain amount of evidence at this point that it is difficult to make algorithms or machine learning engines do exactly what you want them to do and only what you want them to do without un unintended consequences. And you can take an example that was splashed all over the Wall Street Journal recently of Facebook, uh, worried that its engagement metrics were falling a little bit, wanting people to engage more, made this tweak to funnel people more news from people who were you know, close friends and family and people actually in their networks as opposed to outside news sources and things like that. And it worked in terms of increasing engagement, but it backfired in terms of funneling into a lot of angry and, and not always well-informed content and, and, and making that part of the echo chamber much louder. And I think one of the things that financial services are going to have to think really hard about and are going to get asked a lot about by regulators is where, where the machine does what you want it to, but there is an unintended consequence how do you respond to that and how do you adapt to that? And maybe this goes back to some of the conversation that Pat and, and uh, Neil Ferguson had earlier about preparedness and, and real, you know, fire drill preparedness, not just on paper. Because if, if one of these systems has been implemented and it starts having a consequence we don't like, you're not going to turn it off. You're going to have to, to find a way to redirect it. And so what, you know, what's the playbook for doing that? How quickly can it be done? Uh, how quickly can we identify that? Because I think the talk that we heard earlier today about needing circuit breakers in a network uh, is going to be really, really front and center for something like this. So there, thank you very much, James. Uh, so Lars, well, can I uh, jump in on that one? Because um, uh, with um, the, the circuit breakers is, is probably where the, the most interesting piece is coming through now. So we're, we've got a lot of AI applications. I'll, I'll turn the optimism side of me on, Tim. Um, yeah, you know, you know, ABS brakes work a lot better than me slam slamming my foot down. Uh, we, there's a whole heap of things. robots uh, cr creating cars can weld much better than anyone anyone can. Get vision systems with with the right type of lenses on them. They can see see in the dark better than better than I can. Um, but they're using they're doing things of which a humans initiated. So I've chosen to put on the brakes, or a pilot has chosen to push the autopilot button that will send the send the plane over to Sydney um, where they can override it themselves. We're starting to get to a, 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 a interesting point in history where some of those human agencies are starting to be taken away. So for example of autonomous vehicle technology, 
the technology has been around for a decade. And I, I've I've seen been on streets with autonomous vehicles, um, you know, back in 2013 or so, uh, when Google was driving an autonomous car around. Um, yet it doesn't. You don't see them here in Toronto. You don't see them here in, in many cities because our liability laws are, are not there. Um, you know, if an autonomous vehicle crashes into someone here in Toronto, I, I'm not exactly sure who is liable. I'm not. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not. But to, because there's no driver there, who is the who is the agent that actually was at fault? And I'm wondering whether that is, you know, extrapolating that out to to bank board directors and, and dare I say company board directors, yeah. You know, because it moves into that space where, where we're starting to lose some of that human agency, they're starting to wonder, you know, am I li- am I the one liable, being the owner of the corporate? And is that slowing innovation down? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind hearing thoughts from our other panellists on, on that. Yeah. So just to um, both, uh, I'd like to respond to James's observation around Facebook's example where they changed something and then it had an unintended consequence. And also to your point then, Bruce, I think also about um, the potential loss of control. At the end of the day, um, those scenarios may have nothing, the scenario at Facebook might have had nothing to, to do with machine learning, and just to do with a change in the way they built their website. And so what we're really seeing here is a consequence of, because everything's digital, everything's in technology, we're suddenly paying a lot more attention to if a programmer makes a decision to make something and is only optimised for that engagement, um, then, yeah, and it just turns out to create a whole lot of, of um, horrible side effects socially. That wasn't the programmer's mission. The programmer's given one responsibility, just go off and do it. So I think as we take, as our systems become more impactful in society, it's so important that you actually have a deeply, deeply technical leadership team that understands the potential ramifications of this. I think one of the greatest risks of AI is the mystique around it, saying, well, the machine is amazing because some of the improvements are incredible. The fact that a car can stop and anticipate a crash before the human even sees there's a problem, the fact that it can actually work out if the pilot's not driving the plane safely. These sort of techniques are incredibly powerful, but it shouldn't come at the expense of actually recognising you've got to understand how it works and where it could go wrong. You've got to have that comprehension and I think right now we're seeing such rapid advances. There is a risk of falling in love with these techniques and assuming that they're faultless. And that's the greatest risk because these things are not um, uh, incredibly intelligent. They're very good at doing one thing over and over and over again. But they're not good at actually understanding the variations. What happens if? So the example I always like is there's a, the image recognition on a self-driving car is astoundingly good. It takes away the decisions from the driver. Um, it knows what a stop sign is, and a stop sign is pretty easy to recognise. It's an octagon that's bright red, and it can be defeated with three pieces of gaffer tape because it's never seen a stop sign with three pieces of gaffer tape on it. So it doesn't have the general intelligence to go, that looks like it's being graffitied. So if you were a driver and you just trusted this and you, or the manufacturer took away the human primacy because they had such faith in it, without understanding what its weak points are. I think that's the real risk, and I think it's true of lots of technologies. Fascinating. I'd like to pick up on uh, on what, what, you're, what you've just uh, said, Tim, in terms of how we prepare decision makers. Because we were talking about you know, control, we're talking about the benefits, we're talking about the need for a different uh, infrastructure, and we're also talking about the need for decision makers to be prepared for this for this era and uh, the uh, the acceleration of this technology has maybe you know caught them a little bit uh, on the hop I would say right and so how do we how do we prepare decision makers for dealing with let's say an entirely kind of new uh, new era of risk because the uh, the, the current kind of educational set, of, uh, of let's say a, a typical executive in risk uh, or in banking or in you know financial institutions etc is uh, is it, it's fairly it's fairly specific so there's not a lot of deep context when we talk about you know uh, let's say uh, an algorithm suggesting something uh,
institutions say no, no, no. Financial institutions say, uh, in financial institutions say no, 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 no. It's not. It is something that, um, given uh, what are my understanding, let's say if I'm the executive, my understanding of a deeper context of uh, of history and uh, the long run experience, but also to you know to take those insights and to apply them to the you know to the challenge that is that is before you today, right? So how do you like so? I guess my question is, how do you prepare decision makers for dealing with this kind of era of risk? Because even in in some ways, the the AI is uh, is very seductive, right? And you're saying, well, okay, we need uh, we need uh, IT experts to say this is actually what it does and this is what it doesn't do. But it has kind of first, second, or third order effects as well. Uh, it is um, um, perhaps. Uh, uh, prediction over uh, reaction is uh, is a, you know is a question, and just dealing with uh, the preparation of executives in this new era. You're saying Tim is saying, look, this is this is much more powerful than any of the technologies in a in a generation, right? And so on. So that that kind of leads to the question: How do we prepare for that? So. Uh, Maybe I'll, I'll stick with Tim and then I'll go to Bruce and James if, uh, if they want to chime in. I think you have to spend some time on education, not at the, um, the low level stuff, but just at the conceptual level. So when I cannot remember which of um, the people on this panel, or it might have been some of our previous speakers, but um, when we all rushed home in the early days of the pandemic, and people said, oh, we're going to use AI to predict what happens next. You're going, oh, you don't understand what AI is because it can't possibly predict what's happening next because it hasn't got any of the training data, right? And if you've got decision makers hearing some a company saying, I've got a magic technology that can help you, it's just, it's just snake oil in those circumstances. Or if it's not snake oil, it's targeting a very, very narrow field and they need to understand it very, very clearly. Um, I, I think explaining to people understand they have to invest some time in this. Um, my favourite example was um, the, the, there was an army that trained an AI in image recognition to look for tanks in photographs. And they trained it and they tested it and it all worked fine. And then they couldn't find a single tank. And then they went back and looked at it and tried to puzzle out why it was missing. And one of the things, every tank photo had no clouds in it and every photo without tanks had clouds. And so they, did, they built a cloud detection algorithm, right? Now, if it just so happened, if you're looking for tanks with no clouds, then it's, it was fine. So this is the, um, the, the you, people need to understand when they see a result, they've got to spend a little bit more time conceptually, not statistically, not understanding the maths, but conceptually, what has it probably shown you? And then I think they can make key decisions. I think that is really crucial. Every industry is a tech industry now. Tech understanding is not optional. I think uh, the conceptual, uh, yeah, the conceptual point is extremely well taken. I would just, uh, I would just add that the, you know, maybe a, a, a requirement would be kind of a deeper knowledge of the, you know, of the background context of the, of the of the context and that is just not happening in the in the formation of you know in terms of business schools and so forth they or it ha it's happening on the margins but but uh but bruce uh why don't you uh chime in here yeah so um <clears throat> i'm gonna be a bit of a cop out and just say that continuous learning is that essential part of career, career resilience but but yeah, but before that i, I, <laughs> I do want to make a comment that uh lawrence uh, tim and i are both australian so black swans we grew up with them everywhere <laughs> that was a normal spawn. Um, so mo moving back to to, to mach machine learning and, and AI, it, it's like the every other economic uh, creative destruction cycle. There's going to be something new. As in, you know, people had to learn how to use PCs, you know, back in the '80s, and, and completely revolutionised the way that you know that uh, pe people worked. Uh, every single new innovation. If you're an executive, you need to be across it. You need to be across the advantages. You need to be across the disadvantages. How, how it should be how it should be deployed, um, and have that that governance layer over over the top. Um, and you know, going going back to the stuff that, that Neil was saying, um, uh, it's it's not just the the understanding the the risk issue or the, you know, the AI in our case, but we also need to understand the scenario when it fails, 
You know, have, have what's our what's our responses? Is there a manual workaround? Yeah, you know, what's our basically what's our recovery resolution plan for the thing? Um, our fire drill, that that military tactics piece that he was going on about. Um, we, it's this, the risk management is, is a spectrum. You've got the aspect where you need to know the technology, need to get the aspect where you need to know the assumptions that go into the technology, and then you have the aspects of risk management where, where you assume the thing fails. Uh, and it has to cover the whole lot. Otherwise, you, you're just still only blindly working in one spot. Mm. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, I'll just jump in to add one thing, which is I think when it comes to the decision-making that, that senior people in finance are going to have to make as these technologies become more and more prevalent, part of it is going to be around the uh, the tolerance level for their customer bases. And I think when Tim talks about the fact that a lot of people don't understand what machine learning is or how it works and that it, it feels like magic, we have to understand that customers will be awed by that and in some cases absolutely delighted, but also afraid of it to a certain extent and nervous. And you might have a situation, for example, with a self-driving car where you know, introducing self-driving cars drives down the overall number of road accidents dramatically. But can you imagine the reaction to that first fatal accident? Well, we've we've had them, but you know, can can you imagine uh, if if it looks anecdotally in people's own experience like this isn't a totally safe thing, how they may react to that? And I think it will be to some extent the same in banking, in that customers of banks you know, they want new technology, they want things to be faster and simpler and easier and smarter, and they they like mobile apps and, and on and on and on. But it's also a customer base that rewards an industry for, unlike in a lot of other industries, for hanging on to some traditional principles. They like the idea of that, you know, that long history of being steady and safe. And I think a lot of people still quite like the idea that there's money in a vault somewhere um, and that it doesn't all exist in the cloud uh, as as digital ledgers and and those sorts of things. And so I think the the handholding aspect of it for the customer base is going to be really important. And there's going to be key decisions to be made about where you may need to hold something back until the market is really ready for it, uh, even if you're able to do it now technologically. I couldn't agree more, James. I think um, if I could just add to that, I think the banks I've worked for have always, they're using AI the right way. It makes sure you're doing it in the customer's interest. It's one of the most crucial things if you use it just for marketing purposes it's it's the least valuable act activity you can do you've got to look after the customer's interest that's the power of technology and you've got to explain it to your customer base that that's the intent and uh not just uh, driving down transaction costs maybe right no, and i think a lot of the ai applications inside a bank is and customers don't necessarily see it's in the the anti-money laundering scanning through thousands and thousands of transactions to work out which um, which bodega is actually getting way too much cash than they should be uh, and potential laundering issues. And there, there was some work in the, the bank that both um, Tim and I used to work in that, that uh, um, went through um, transactions when there was a bunch of one cent transactions, uh, one cent um, uh, money transfers to, to find out that those one cent money transfers was a way for an ex partner to abuse their abuse financially abuse their um their spouse and, and to detect those sorts of societal issues that that we as a, a broader organization than just making money um, that we're here as a, a part of a nation builder that that, that is so uh, we have plenty of applications that we do good for the society yeah that it, yeah it is all part of uh uh, what a lot of people call, you know, the purpose. Uh, mm. We have uh, we have uh, a lot of questions, and we we only have a, a, a few minutes. But um, there are, there are some really fantastic questions. So I'm sorry I'm not going to get to all of them. But let me start. Um, to the panelists, it seems that for extreme events, the quality and speed of the response, as we saw this morning with Ferguson is now valued more than the efforts toward prediction. So do you expect a shift in the allocation of risk resources in favor uh, of reaction over prediction? Uh, uh, anybody? Yeah, just like it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those kind of perhaps uh, to, to the, you know, the, uh, an imponderable because the, you know, AI is kind of based on, you know, the uh, they're kind of prediction machines, if you will. Yeah, so, so we're, 
it's what it's predicting. And then this is where AI, AI tends to be really good as an interpolation engine. Um, you know, you have a, a bunch of things and you can work out what that pattern is. It interpolates really well. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the principal role of a risk manager. You know, if, if we were economists and we were trying to forecast the middle, yeah, the you know, interpolation engine's great. But risk managers are more interested in what's happening at the tail. Um, and so that's where some of the AI applications for that quantification of risk, you have to be very wary of. In the same way that Carol Ann was saying, you, you know, was in, yep, you've got a model, but it, it, it's a model. It, it's, it's not necessarily reality. You've got to take it with a grain of salt. Um, so I think that mentality is already there with risk managers um, because yeah. of the fact that we, we are so much concentrating on tail events. Right, right. Here's a here's a, a, a much broader question. Um, other issues above and beyond bias data and algorithms and the loss of agency include echo chambers, loss of human volition, the erosion of skills and knowledge at the level of the individual versus growth of the collective intelligence, long term job losses, faster than faster than they can be replaced, uh, surveillance capitalism, uh, uh, which uh, is, has been made famous by, by uh, Zuboff's book. So uh, what are your perspectives on that? Because uh, that is, <laughs> you can take just one of them, or these are kind of the, 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 the broader, talking about the broader context. James, what do you think about that? Uh, I could probably pick up the job loss as one of that, because that's something I've done a, a certain amount of reporting on, is trying to understand where that may go. And I think it would probably be naive to think that there's not going to be a significant impact on the workforce. That doesn't necessarily mean all job losses. Uh, I had RBC's chief human resources officer tell me they they reckon about 30% of their jobs will be significantly impacted in some way. That doesn't necessarily mean cut. It, you know, Some of those people can be retrained, redeployed, and I think that is what they're planning to do. But I've also seen surveys of senior bankers that say, you know, maybe 10 to 30 percent of back office roles uh, will probably be uh, made somewhat redundant. And so I think there are huge retraining efforts underway at banks. And I think that's important. I think we need to understand not everybody's going to be able to, to, to cross that gap. You know, there will be some people in in fairly basic clerical roles who are not going to be able to make a jump to the the level of uh, analytic capability in the time they have. I'm not saying they couldn't be trained over time, but but you know, you're not going to be able to retrain someone on a, a short time frame while they're working to do that. And so I think there will be a certain level of disruption. And I think it will be up to banks to decide how they want to manage that and and to think about things like pro- political perception, because I do think we live in a country where if a bank suddenly came out and said, I think we don't need 30% of these people anymore, we're going to walk them out of the door tomorrow, they'd get a, a, an expletive filled uh, call from the finance minister uh, within the hour. So, Well, yeah, it would be back to the future then, wouldn't it? <laughs> In some ways, uh, yeah, the... Uh, the the calls from uh, from finance over the uh, over the many years uh, has been uh, kind of an interesting feature of the political economy of banking. Uh, uh, but, uh, James, how how Bruce, would that? Um, I'm interested in the historical context of that. How how would that contrast to say the mid '80s when automatic teller machines suddenly appeared and and branches uh, consolidated? I mean, I, I think that's a great example because it tells you that the prediction that jobs are just going to be wiped out on mass is probably not right. The industry does adapt. It has, you know, there are lots of areas where there's a war for talent and they are desperate for more people. And one of the ways to fill that is going to be to retrain people and, and repurpose people and, and, and find a way to do that. So I think the historical example tells you that we may sometimes overstate the extent to which technology is going to displace people. It's, I think it's more that it displaces roles and it changes roles and it changes jobs um, and there is short-term hardship and interruption for people, but it, it's not so much that over the long run people are displaced, perhaps. Uh, which is, at, is at the bank I'm at, Go ahead, go ahead, Tim. At the bank I'm at, over 10% of our staff in our organisation are engineers. Um, that doesn't include software testers, that doesn't include deployment managers, it doesn't include all the other IT people. So and presumably common. that's going to keep growing, right? We can't fill we can't fill all the roles. We've got more. We've got a huge demand. So I see that as a, a creative in value. To um, I think it's going to change the roles. Of, some roles will go. New roles will come. And you know, to James's uh, James's point about uh, technological change and 
and uh, public uh, public responses to it. It's uh, it's axiomatic in the you know in the field to say that uh, people will often uh, overestimate the you know the the impact of uh, of technology in the short run and underestimate it in the long run, right? So because there are you know there are movements you know underneath the surface that are uh, that are creating uh, you know major and permanent change, whereas the more superficial changes are. Uh, seem to be important in the moment, but uh, then kind of fade away into, uh, uh, you know, into kind of a trivial irrelevance. Uh, maybe not for the people of that generation, but certainly uh, looking at it, uh, you know, from the long run. And so, uh, so Lars, uh, yeah. do we have time to tackle another one of, of that laundry list you gave? Uh, yes, yeah. You, you, to yeah, you so, is the last uh, word. To you will be yeah, because you, you opened up, uh, you know, as in you know, situational history that that then allows people to well in some ways it erodes erodes certain rights and so i would pick on the the surveillance one um that's surveillance in certainly certainly here in in toronto or in, in canada you it's it's a bad thing you you don't want to have cameras out there working out where people are going uh and you go, oh, hang on, this this looks like an authoritarian state, such as you know that that's what you, the social credit system over in China is doing. They're, they're doing all this facial recognition stuff. Yet, situationally, you know, with the IRA bombing London, the number of cameras inside central London, you you are tracked. <laughs> as in, there's no high definition cameras. So they they've as a society have accepted a certain ethical standard when it comes to that privacy surveillance side of things compared to the um, what what has defaulted over here. Um, and they get certain benefits, uh, so mostly security-orientated benefits, and there are some unintended unintended consequences. I'm not sure whether we're, we're having these open discussions because this technology is here. It's available, um, and people are using it. And and we, you know, this is this is something that, that really, as a as a society, we we have to have these open discussions. And maybe the long run institute could be the place. Perhaps, perhaps, uh, in association with the Global Risk Institute. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much indeed. Yes, that is, uh, it's 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 a point well taken. It's not always a black mirror episode, right? It's not always the worst kind of, you know, uh, you know, worst possible scenario, although there were some really good episodes, I will say. And so with that, uh, uh, my sincere appreciation to uh, to Tim, to Bruce, to to James, to each of our panelists and uh, just an excellent discussion. And uh, thank you so much for your for your insights. Like I say, it's the, the those different angles of vision that uh, that come with. Uh, different, um, you know, your interdisciplinary perspectives that are uh, very valuable indeed. So that's, uh, it's very insightful.